I'm back. It's time for another Fight Quest story. This time, Kaji Kembo in San Jose, California. I'm going to be honest from the beginning here. I'm going to make some enemies. Some people just aren't going to like what I have to say about this. Uh, when I first started this idea of telling some behind-the-scenes stories about Fight Quest, I told myself I'd be honest about what happened from my perspective and my point of view. So, I know Doug's experiences as they were related to me by Doug, and there are other people's experiences on the crew and stuff like that that I haven't spoken about and I haven't talked about um, because it didn't happen to me and I'm not going to speak for somebody else. The difficulty is something like Kajukembo, when we did the style itself, my experiences weren't particularly positive about the style itself. Now, the thing is that I want to get out, out of the way right away is everybody from the Kaju Kembo world or that, that school that we went to, very, very welcoming, really great people. Master Gaylord, the guy who uh, was in charge of, of my training, a really nice guy, very welcoming. Everybody was great. But the issues I had training there, I'm going to be totally honest about. And if people get upset about it, they get upset about it. But I can only speak about my personal experiences. So here's what happened. The From the outset, I thought the choice of style with what the producers wanted to do was a little flawed. They wanted to do an MMA episode, essentially, without going to an actual MMA school, without going to AKA or Jackson Wink or American Top Team. Now, this is you know 12 years ago, but those schools were still around. There were their big major schools. Uh, Militage Camp was around still. So, I think... Um, so they wanted to do kind of an MMA episode, but they wanted to be a little different, a little more exotic. They wanted to push from a slightly different angle, so they did this Kaja Kimbo thing. I knew from the start we were going to have problems because with other styles that, that weren't combative, where it wasn't about going toe-to-toe -to -toe and all this stuff, that was part of the style itself, and we accepted it. When it came to Hapkido, if you saw that episode, you know, it's, it wasn't a combative style, so we had to kind of go around it and make it more about the beauty of the style or whatever, and me trying to learn techniques that I wasn't familiar with. There was a way around actual combat. So with Kajikimbo, the problem we had was the first day. I show up there. I meet everybody. Once again, really nice guys, really big facility. Um... A lot of students, everybody was really welcoming and gracious. So they said, we're going to evaluate your kicking, your punching, and your grappling. Fine. We get in there, and for the boxing, Andre Ward, you should train there. They had a big picture of Andre Ward up there. And apparently as an amateur, that's where he trained. So they had decent boxing. And so I get in there, and the, the guy's working my hands, the boxing. And at the end, he goes, hey, man, great stuff. Change X, Y, and Z. You know, be sure you do this, this, and that. No problem. We go to the kicking section. My kicking background is mostly Muay Thai, which is, you know, a lot of leg kicks and stuff like that. And so, anyway, I went through this whole kicking regimen. And the guy goes, okay, you should change, you know, X, Y, and Z and be more versatile with your kicks or whatever. And I said, no problem. Then we go to the grappling section. And they had this kid there who was 19, 20 years old. And they said, okay, you're going to grapple with our top grappling student. He's the son of the instructor and all this stuff. And I went, okay, cool, fine, no problem. I was only a purple belt at the time. But, you know, I, I, we had done the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu episode in Brazil and all this stuff. And I had been grappling for a long time. And I smoked this kid. Smoked him. We probably rolled for five minutes. I probably submitted him seven or eight times. Easily. Just, I wasn't even going for it. And he was supposedly a purple belt or whatever, but maybe a blue belt. And so, anyway, everybody kind of goes like this. Everybody, I remember everybody getting kind of uncomfortable and weird because that's not supposed to happen. You know, if you remember the show, from the beginning, the trajectory of the show is I start out learning and getting my ass kicked, and then I go up and I learn at the end. Me and Doug. That was kind of the trajectory of the show. So, everybody kind of steps back and goes, ugh. And then, so, Master Gaylord goes, okay, you're going to take on his dad, who's an instructor. He's been training 15 years. And I went, okay, fine. So we start grappling, and whenever you're fighting somebody who might be, remember this is no gi, so whenever you're taking on somebody who might be advanced or whatever, you don't know their level, you, you kind of feel them out for a minute. You don't necessarily just fly for something crazy. You kind of feel out where their balance is, where their weaknesses might be and all stuff. So we shake hands. I start doing that, you know, kind of feeling them out. 
And Master Gaylord, probably because he was on camera, went, come on, guys, let's go. And I went, okay. And I jumped guard on the guy really high, like underneath his armpits, pull him down. He sits up. I sit up for a wrist lock behind his elbow, and he starts screaming. I sat up, and I popped his wrist. Didn't break it, but I strained it pretty bad. And he's literally rolling around on the ground, like holding his wrist. Everybody in the room was like, oh, crap, and, and kind of low-level freaked out, especially the producers. And remember, this is my first day. And so, remember, this is their grappling instructor, this guy who teaches their guys, and I just smoked him in about a minute. So, a little background, if you're not familiar with jiu-jitsu at all, or if it's not really your thing, wrist locks in that position in closed guard, when you're in a closed guard position, someone sits up and posts their hands against your stomach or your ribs, wrist lock is a really easy way to get a guy moving because I sit up, I go behind your elbow and I, I do like a crunch basically and it bends the wrist backward. Well, most high level guys aren't going to fall for that. But what it does is it makes them move. They can't just keep their hands there posting. So when I go for wrist lock, they move out of the way. Now my instructor, Black Belt, I try to wrist lock him all the time. He always tries to wrist lock me. It doesn't work. I don't successfully, successfully wrist lock him, but it, it makes him move. He's got to let go of that stability for a sec to, to save his wrist. So it's a good way if you're in close guard to get a guy moving is you go for the wrist and they can't just sit there and post on you. So he fell for a move that isn't really supposed to catch somebody above purple belt, really, um, especially that quickly, especially no gi where there's a little more room to move your hand. So on for the rest of my time there because it was supposed to be kind of an MMA episode, but nobody there could could handle me on the ground, which I'm not tooting my own horn. I was a purple belt. I wasn't fantastic. I don't, I don't think I'm fantastic now, even as a black belt. There are plenty of guys who kick my ass on the ground. And they didn't have anybody there that was even close. And so we were put in this situation, or I was put in this situation, of trying to film an MMA episode when, as soon as it went to the ground, it was over. So... Whenever we would train after that, the, the ground was almost eliminated. And then their stand-up, they had some decent stand-up guys. But we were, we're going to do an episode in Thailand. We had already done a bunch of stand-up episodes. And so the, 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 the trick we were in was to make this episode look different or like an MMA episode without actually doing MMA. Now, the producers were... It was tough. It was really tough. And... So from then on out, that's one of the reasons in this episode you see a lot of group attack stuff. You see a lot of five people jumping me at the same time and all this stuff because every time we did a one-on-one -on -one thing, if I was allowed to go to the ground, it was over. It was over really quickly. They didn't have great wrestling. They didn't have great jujitsu. They had decent stand-up, but it, th that wasn't visually any different than any other stand-up we had done. The only thing that made this episode different is that it's MMA, so we can do stuff on the ground. And there, they were just way behind. And so, a little background on MMA at this point, what was it, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, is one of the things about the, the, the explosion of MMA in the last 15 years or so is it's hard to succeed and not be affiliated with a major team. When I was starting out in the late 90s, early 2000s, you, there were a lot of like mid-level teams around. You could find an MMA team around you. They weren't necessarily that good, but that you could at least get the basics going. And there were enough local shows that you could, you could be at a medium-level gym, go to a local show, cut your teeth, and have a decent record d depending on who you were training with and how talented you were and all this stuff. So there was a, a range of like these mid-level teams that could get you ready for a local show but could never get you to those to, to the heights of the sport. In the last few years, MMA has become very, very top-heavy. So it's in the United States, it's Bellator, PFL, UFC. Other than that, you have a day job. You just can't make money working at the local scene. So a lot of those mid-level teams that could only get you really through the mid-level, they're not around anymore. A lot of them just don't exist anymore. It's big mega team that can get to the UFC, or it's a really small team, and that's about it. That maybe give you gives you more private instruction. But so the mid-level, you could win a local fight or an amateur fight. Those teams now it's almost like look, if you can't get me all the way, it's it's, it's hard to make a living. So 
the, the, the guys I was training with were at that mid-level. Maybe. And remember, I only fought at the, at the mid-local level at this point. But they just didn't have the ground game to, to really make actual mixed martial arts that could compete. So I remember the kid that I grappled with in the beginning, the son of the instructor, came up to me at one point, And he was doing this stick stuff. Because they did a bunch of different martial arts there. And he was doing this stick stuff in the corner. And he came up to me and he goes, oh, Man, I want to make it as a mixed martial artist. You know, What do I need to do? And I said, put the sticks down. Stop. See how stick kata form stuff you were doing? Yeah, stop that. The guys you were fighting, the guys at AKA, remember this is Northern California, so I was the closest big team. They're not doing any of that stuff. Every waking moment, they can be better mixed martial artists. That's what they're doing. That's what they're improving their wrestling, their jiu-jitsu, and their kickboxing. That's it. Anything else you are doing is taking away from your time. You don't go to an NFL uh, practice facility and see a basketball hoop. All right? If you're doing something, it's football-related, and that's it. That's how you have to see it. It's a professional job. That's your full-time job is being a better fighter. So everything else, all the extraneous stuff, you have to stop doing that. So it led to all these really difficult, awkward moments. The third or fourth day I was there, we were doing a thing where they had set up three MMA fights in a row for me. Where we're we're there, and, and I think it was Master Gaylord came up to me. Okay, you're gonna fight three guys in a row, five minute rounds. They get a fret, you know. They switch. It's three different guys, and you don't get any breaks. So it's five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. New guy every time. And I went, okay. I'd done stuff like that before, getting in from MMA fights. I'm gonna you know fight round robin everybody. And so everybody in the gym is around this mat, and just MMA gloves on. I don't remember if we had anything headgear or anything. Might, might have had headgear on, but. They lined up the three guys. The first guy, double leg, mount, armbar, in less than a minute. Second guy, same thing, takedown, leg lock, less than a minute. Third guy, I pulled guard on that guy, triangled them less than a minute. All three guys. N- no guy lasted more than a minute with me. And I got up, took my gloves off. My producer is furious. She goes, I hope, you can u- I hope that was fun. We can't use any of that. And I went, that's not my problem. I, I don't know what they want in an MMA fight. I did an MMA fight. It, this isn't my... And we got in this argument. Where I was like, look, I, I can't carry him. You know, this is a style that that you want in MMA stuff. I can't carry him and make it look decent. You know, it's if, if, if this were, you know, the Hapkido episode is a good example of a kind of a non-combative style. Sure, I could just step forward and just elbow the dude's head through the wall. That doesn't look like you know have keto that that would be you know i would understand you getting mad at me at that but we're doing what they told me to do we're doing the style that they claim to be good at they we're doing what this episode is supposed to be which is an mma episode i just beat all these guys in an mma fight I, I don't know what you want from me and so it led to situations like that all the time because once it came out a real mma the, the, the ground game wasn't there it wasn't there at all they couldn't stop a basic takedown i am not a great wrestler i wrestled in high school i did not wrestle division one or anything like that and i took these guys down at will i submitted them at will that that shouldn't happen at a decent i, I couldn't go to aka and smoke three guys in a row that are anywhere near my size or skill level and so that's what that that was kind of the episode and and that's why it was tough then we ended up filming all the stuff outside and like group attack stuff and this dude was seven feet tall and i was always sparring with that guy because it looked good because i he was a gigantic dude and so it you know i could get beat up enough for them to get footage of that but it was super duper challenging to, to film because of that lack of balance where once i it got in my wheelhouse it was over and without that it's not mma so they made this rule before the final fight, and I think well before the final fight, that I couldn't go to the ground for more than three seconds. They just made that up. <laughs> it was not part of the style or anything. They just made that up so that I couldn't just go out there and submit the guy. So we were doing this group thing in the, the group fight in the gym itself, and so all these guys were jumping on me, and that seven-foot-tall dude was there too. And I fell, and I hit the pillar that was holding up the building like there's this big huge pillar and the whole building shook that's how hard i hit it so boom they got on camera and I, I hit the pillar and i'm like jesus Christ. and i was five guys on top of me whatever it was um 
they had to do stuff like that over and over. So it got visually kind of repetitive because there was very little one-on-one -on -one stuff except this giant guy. And then I heard from one of the, you know, the people behind the and the producers I was working with, they were like, we have the same footage of you sparring this gigantic dude over and over and over again. It's just doesn't look good but no one else wanted to go with me so it th that was another challenge too so and another one was it, it was kind of an all-age training thing so they put me in this class and i'm you know doing my jumping jacks and warm-up and stuff and the cameraman comes up and he goes how's it going and off camera obviously i was like well if the nine-year-old next to me can do it i think i'll be okay <laughs> so we were laughing they, they, they had to do all this stuff to shoot it to like keep the fact that kids were doing it not that there's any problem with kids doing it, but it, it looks, once again, how tough can it be if a nine-year-old is doing it and I'm doing it? It's supposed to be really hard for me. It's not supposed to be easy for me. Well, if there's a seven-year-old doing the same thing I'm doing, I think I can keep up with them. So those were the issues that, that all came with Kaja Kimbo was it's MMA, but in a real MMA fight, they just weren't there. They just didn't have the skill level for an actual full MMA fight that could be realistic and work. So the final fight rolled around. And they put me with this gigantic biker guy. Remember, Doug's team are like these kind of, like, I don't mean to be, they, I don't know if they were bikers, but they had that kind of look. They like they, all these big goatees and were kind of like the, the underground fighting kind of guys or are the ones Doug went with. And I think I fought one of their guys, if I'm not mistaken. And as soon as I saw him, it was a big biker dude, I was like, he's going to be out of gas in a minute and a half, maybe. Just immediately, he looked like a weightlifter. And if you know anything about combat sports, guys like that have no gas. They can be strong for a minute, but they have no gas at all. So we go to this warehouse thing for the final fight. And first I did a group attack thing. And one of the things they taught me, which I found really interesting, was in a group attack, grab one of the guys and use him as a shield. So we did this group attack thing with, I forget how many guys, five or something. And there was a kid in there who was like 16 that I was training with. And I, remember I grabbed him and went, sorry, kid. As soon as it started, I just used him as a shield and kind of swung him around as I'm fighting all these guys. So it was kind of like I had him in one hand and I'm using the other hand to kick and defend and block and all stuff. So I kind of used him as a shield and kind of moved him around. And, and that's how I did the final, the, the, the group fight. So then they pair us off for the actual fight with this biker guy. And... The rule is I couldn't go to the ground more than, these, more than three seconds. I knew damn well it wouldn't take me three seconds to submit this guy. Easy. I could fly right into something and, you know, I don't need even that second or third second. So we start going and the first thing I do, I, I roll to a leg lock and I let him go. And I stood up. And then we did something else where I took him out. I, I went for something and I just let it go. because I was letting him know if I want to finish this, I can finish this in less than three seconds. I wanted to make that clear. So I did a couple of those where I could have finished it, but it would have been horrible on camera for me to just take this guy down and leg lock him and finish it. I didn't want to do that. So I did a couple moves basically to let the guy know what the deal was. And then I stood up with him. And he was completely out of gas. And also one of the reasons I did that too is, is you know, change up the, the routine on him. You know, make him defend the takedown real quick when he's not ready for it. And then when he went to stand up, man, the guy was already pretty much done. And so we're standing up, and I'm, you know, doing my boxing and kickboxing, whatever. And the dude's just completely out of gas. And this is the only time in a real fight scenario that I kind of held back and 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 let the guy finish the fight because the other other styles, once again, have is the best example that you guys have seen previously. The style itself wasn't that combative, so the final fight wasn't supposed to be that combative. Like, we're telling you from the beginning it's not supposed to be that combative. So, I, I didn't feel like I was holding back in those fights. I was doing Hapkido. With this one that was supposed to be MMA, he was standing up, and I, I we kind of clinched up, and I was, I'm not joking, I was carrying him. I was holding him up in this clinch position. And I'm in his ear, and he's like, oh, he can't, he can't do anything. And I turn, and I'm in his ear. And remember, the camera's on us. We're live on television, not live, but we're on TV. They're recording it for television. And I said, you gotta keep throwing punches, dude. I turn, I, I, I turn in his ear, and it's like, you gotta keep throwing, man. Even if you don't have any pop, you have to, because if you don't, I gotta finish you. If, if you're not punching, and I don't finish you, it's gonna look bad. So you have to keep your punches going. You have to keep throwing right now. 
And the dude goes, uh-huh. And, and, you know, he threw enough that it, it looked okay. But I was telling him, you have to keep hitting me, even if you can't put anything behind these punches. And so I kind of held him up with my shoulder a little bit. And I'm throwing punches or whatever. But we're in this clinch position partly because he couldn't. If I broke off, he would have been so exhausted I would have had to finish him. Because it just would have looked bad. It would be obvious that I'm, I can finish this guy and I'm not. So I kind of held him up with my shoulder. And we're in the clinch throwing these punches or whatever. And time right now. That's what we did. So that was how my fight ended. And it was clear throughout this fight. That I could have finished this guy whenever I wanted. I, it, I don't know if it looked that way on camera, but to everyone there live, it was clear that I could have finished this guy whenever I wanted to, and I was playing nice. So we finish. Doug's fight starts, and Doug's opponent is furious. I just embarrassed one of their guys, and so Doug's opponent was just like raring to go at Doug. He could not wait to get at Doug, and. The fight starts. The guy comes right after Doug. Doug moves a little bit, threw a head kick, and knocked this dude out. Straight up knocked him completely out. Boom. And the kid's just trying to sit up. He's clearly out. I mean, any fight, you know, that would have been over. And that was it. The one time Doug just got a head kick knockout was against these guys. And it was that, that was the end of the episode and i was thrilled really happy for doug and and all this stuff but the 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 difficulty in filming this episode was they wanted mma without going to an mma gym where we could really get mma it was a style that that really wasn't prepared to do that and um that's it, it's unfortunate it was it was tough and and i don't like the idea that i'm gonna out the style here but that that that's precisely what happened and it was um they were great guys, really friendly. And Master Gillard has since passed away. Um, really welcoming, great people. But it, it, the, the, that episode had the challenges of we couldn't do everything I knew how to do because they weren't prepared for it. And I had to make the show decent by not doing that. And that always leads to complications and challenges. But that's it. Next one, big break in the show that I will talk about. And then... Muay Thai in Thailand. All right, so enjoy.